Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Dogs Podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network. My name is Rob Doster. I am coming to you uh, within the hour of UConn picking up a championship in the Empire Classic, another championship for the Huskies. We're going to hang the banner. We're going to put that one up in uh, in in uh, in the practice facility. We're going to make sure that we always remember the 2023 Empire Classic. I certainly uh, will not probably by the time uh, this podcast comes to an end, but uh, it was another uh, pair of impressive performances, pair of really big games and big wins in non-conference play. Uh, it's the first real test that UConn has had, and they passed with flying colors. They beat Indiana 77-57 to 57 on Sunday afternoon, and then they beat Texas in the championship game 81-71. to 71. Um, And there's a lot to talk to about, talk about with these two games and these two performances and these two wins uh, in the Garden. Um, it is worth mentioning that Texas was missing two guys. Caden Shedrick, who had 27-7 and seven, uh, in the semifinal win over Louisville, did not play. And Dylan Disu has not played yet this season as he is still recovering from a foot injury. Uh, I believe it's still um, complications from the injury that held him out of the Elite Eight uh, in the Sweet 16 when Texas made that run last season. But first and foremost, uh, like, rate, review subscribe, do all of those things that you know is going to make me happy as a podcaster. If you enjoy what you hear on this show or on anything on the field of 68, the best way for you to help support it uh, for what the free content is just rating, reviewing, engaging, any of that stuff, uh, retweeting, reposting, sharing on Instagram. Uh, anything is very, very much appreciated. I met a lot of you guys last night. I met a lot of people that listen to the show that listen to the field of 68. Um, and and it was uh, it was fun to to see that people actually enjoy the stuff that we put our heart and soul into on here. So uh, it's I, I hope that you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoy doing it. So um, let's talk about UConn. Let's talk about this performance. Let's talk about Monday night's win. Uh, I think it's worth noting here. This this stat comes from Jeff Borzello of ESPN. This was the 22nd consecutive uh, non Big East opponent that UConn has beaten by double digits. If you go back to uh, last season. The next two games that UConn plays are non-conference games against Manhattan and New Hampshire, who uh, I think it's safe to assume will get beaten by double figures by UConn if they play uh, anywhere near the way that they played the last two nights. The longest streak in the last 40 years was when North Carolina won 23 straight non-conference games by double digits from November 2008. Uh, through November 2009. If you remember, the 2008-2009 team is the one that won the national title when Tyler Hansbrough was a senior. So it was their national title year when they steamrolled everybody in the NCAA tournament and then some of the bye games that they played uh, in the fall of 2009. That is wild when you think about it. That is uh, incredible when you think about just how good they've been outside of the league, and it makes it even more impressive that they found a way to not win the Big East regular season title uh last season so um hopefully this will be a little bit more of a successful year in big east play for us uconn fans uh but that's um another conversation for another day got to get through kansas got to get through north carolina got to get through gonzaga first before we uh even go down there all right i know everyone is going to want to talk about samson johnson and the performance that he had he scored 15 points he had i believe it was eight rebounds i, I was looking at the espn box and the espn box isn't always going to be entirely accurate um but I think I want to start by talking about Tristan Newton and talking about Alex Caravan. Before the season, I said that the two keys to this UConn team being able to be in the mix for repeating as national champions beyond just the defense, and we'll talk about the defense in a second, it was Caravan and Newton developing into killers, developing into go-to guys, developing into players that you could trust to be able to go not just get a shot, but go get a bucket in the biggest possessions of the game, whether it is uh, doing something in ball screens, going off the bounce, going one-on-one -on -one for Caravan, which was really impressive today, making an open three. Um, and I thought that uh, the last two days, both of them were incredible on opposite nights. Tristan Newton had 23 points, 11 boards, and six assists, drew 10 fouls, got to the free throw line, was just outstanding against Indian. Everything that you want a player like him uh, to be, he was that. Caravan was not. He 
I had 11 in the first half. And then in the second half, I think he missed a whole bunch of open threes. He kind of struggled um, finding the rhythm and finding the range, especially in the second half of the game. Uh, and then on Monday night, it was kind of flipped, right? Like Tristan Newton got off to a slow start. He made a couple free throws. He had a three. Um, he had a big fadeaway jumper um, early in the second half that kind of stemmed a Texas run. But it was Caravan's buckets down the stretch. He had um, the the pump fake two dribble, a little pull up in the lane that that pushed a four point lead back to sixty three fifty seven. On the very next possession, he had that post up and fade away over Max Aismas that just barely beat the shot clock. And then I think it was three possessions later, he had another one that barely beat the shot clock, a pull up going to his left, um, shooting it over the top of. I want to say it was Tyrese Hunter. All three of them were ridiculous. All three of them were such tough mid range jumpers. All three of them were exactly what you don't want out of an offense that is kind of designed with an analytical mindset, the way that UConn's offense is designed, but Hey, sometimes players got to make shots. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I said, I think that having those two be all big East, all America honorable mention, maybe caliber players is the difference between UConn being really good and UConn, like legitimately having a chance to repeat. And I think we saw what both of them can be at their absolute best the last two nights and as long as you are getting something in the neighborhood of what those performances were you don't got to get 23 11 to 6 from Tristan Newton every single night but if we're getting a season where he's averaging like 16 6 and 6 which is kind of what he did the last two nights that is that is good enough to be in the mix for a big east player of the year award and I don't say that lightly um Alex Caravan if he's making open threes, if he is beating people off the bounce, if he's able to go and get you 20 on nights when you need 20, if he's able to make plays at the end of a clock uh, to um, to kind of stem the tide and stem runs and, and have those uh, momentum-shifting jump shots and momentum-shifting buckets, like that is a game-changer for uh, UConn as well. And I don't think enough can be said about how good Spence, Cam Spencer was the last two nights he averaged 17 points he averaged five boards he averaged three and a half assists he had a bunch of open threes and all of that stuff matters and all of that stuff is important but i think what's even more relevant for this team in this program is the decision making right the fact that he's always in the right spot the fact that he's always making the right play the fact that he gives UConn that second playmaker and that second distributor and he can do all of it while being a guy that spaces the floor being a guy that posts up to be need to get, being a guy that you can use in ball screens and you can use in DHOs that can get to the basket being a guy that can run off of pin downs like he's just so so versatile in what he can do and how he can be used offensively and he's always in the right place that you don't have to really worry about it. like he doesn't make mistakes he's he's uh <laughs> For lack of a better term, when it comes to a player like him, he is heady, he is savvy, he looks like a coach's son. He lives up to all of the, uh, let's just call them the Aaron Craft cliches, right? Um, but he's, I think he is a perfect addition. He's competitive as hell. He's tough as hell. He's not phased by the moment. He hits game winning shots. He hits big buckets. And I've always, I, I've, I've made this point over and over and over again, not just on Top Dogs, but on uh, the field of 68, back when I was writing for NBC. If you go back and look at like the last 15 years of college basketball national champions, almost all of them play with basically two initiators, two creators, two guys that can make plays off the bounce, right? You almost need two uh, two point guards on your roster to be able to win the title. We saw it with Tristan Newton and Andre Jackson last season, right? We saw it with, um, with like Russ Smith and Peyton Siever when Louisville won their national championship. We saw it with Shabazz Napier and Ryan Boatwright when UConn won in 2014. We saw it with Kemba Walker and Shabazz when UConn won in 2011. Um, when you can have multiple people that can initiate offense, that can make plays, that can create for others, that can make it easy for someone like a Donovan Klingon or a Samson Johnson um, or a solo ball, like guys that are finishers, it's very 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 important to be able to have that and uh he brings it and he allows UConn to operate the same way even when they don't have the guy that we thought was going to be the kid the the Andre Jackson replacement in Stephen Castle right so uh I I could not be more impressed I cannot be more enthused I cannot be more excited like Cam Spencer is just an absolute killer and he is what every 
uh, a very, very, very good college basketball team needs. I can see why Rutgers fans were so pissed uh, when he decided to um, transfer out of the program and chase that NIL bag. Uh, I'm not worried about Donovan Klingon yet. He finished with seven points and nine boards against Indiana, which was like he he created a lot of havoc on the offensive glass. He had seven offensive rebounds, and uh, he could have finished with probably 15 to 18 points if he finished some layups around the bucket he normally makes, if he finished some ducks or dunks around the rim that he normally makes, if the guy could actually make a damn free throw. Like, we got to we gotta figure that out now. I mean, you gotta, I, I think at this point it's the yips. Like, it's in his head. He's not a bad shooter. He doesn't have a bad release. I just think he – it's a – it's a mental game with him at this point. So make a couple, let's see a couple go down let's get out of that headspace. Let's uh, let's start shooting with some confidence because once he's able to start making those free throws and um, getting fouled becomes a, a situation where you're looking at like giving up 1.5 points per possession instead of like, what is it now? Probably 0. 0.6 points per possession when he's shooting what he is right now from the line. That's a big, big difference maker. And it uh, reduces the incentive to just foul him every time he gets the ball around the basket. But um, to me, he kind of looks still like a guy that missed a month of practice heading into the season, right? Like there's situations where he is laying the ball in instead of just catching it and dunking it like he did last year. There are situations where uh, he's going up for a dunk, but other guys are able to like the, the, the play last night, I guess on Sunday night where Malik Renew was able to get up and kind of knock the ball out of his hands as he was going up for a dunk. There was the lob that didn't count where he went up to catch it, but he kind of caught it on the palm of his hand. And instead of throwing down a dunk uh, that wouldn't have counted, it was after the play, he kind of caught it and threw it straight into the rim. Um, There was the play on Monday night where uh, he went up on the right side of the basket and then finished on the left side, but it was a layup instead of going and uh, dunking it with two hands. Like he just, he looks like he's still trying to find his rhythm a, a little bit on that end of the floor. And I have no doubt that he's going to get there. I'm not worried about Donovan Klingon in the slightest. Um, I think that he was very, very effective and very, very good uh, against Indiana. Like Indiana is a team that wants to do everything in the paint and they couldn't do anything in the paint outside of Malik Renault. And um, he shut down Khalil Ware, who's been a bad dude for, uh, for most of this season, right? And he was a game changer on the offensive glass, seven offensive rebounds. A lot of those were, uh, there were other offensive rebounds that just his mere presence allowed UConn to be able to get. So as you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM Sportsbook for this college basketball season. We're going to be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and predictions throughout the college basketball season. And we are going to have special offers for you, the listeners and the viewers on the field of 68 each and every week during the season. If you haven't signed up with BetMGM yet, use the bonus code FIELD1500 and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager on BetMGM Sportsbook. Here's what you got to do. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD1500. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You will receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure you use the bonus code FIELD1500 1500 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient for me when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly. When cross the state borders, just log into your existing account instead of having to create new accounts in each state that you go to. And most importantly, I got to let you know, We do have some fun stuff coming up for this college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boosts, my personal favorite, parlay odds boosts. So download the BetMGM app today. Um, And then against Texas, I think think that had to do with a matchup more than anything else, right? I think it's a little bit of a bad matchup for him against Texas when they go with that small ball lineup and Caden Shedrick's not out there. Like Dylan Smith was kind of playing a small ball five. I'm sorry, Dylan Mitchell was kind of playing a small ball five role. Um, and uh, that's just not a great, it's not a great matchup for Donovan. I think it's part of why he got into a little bit of foul trouble early. I think that's why uh, he was a little bit less effective, but um, the luxury of having a guy like Samson Johnson coming off the bench is the same kind of luxury that UConn had last season with Donovan Klingon coming off the bench. And I mean, look, let's, let's get into it, man, because Samson was so unbelievably good for UConn tonight. He finished with, I think it was, like I said, 15 points and eight boards. 
but it was the energy. It was the athleticism around the basket. It was the lob target and the role man that, uh, that was really, really effective. It was the fact that he was a little bit more switchable defensively and more versatile defensively. And he had a couple huge blocks. And it's one of those things where when he comes in, it's he plays with energy and then the plays that he makes are energy giving plays, if that makes sense. And what I mean by that is he's coming in and his motor is always running hot. Like he is not going to come in there and just kind of be out there going through the motions. Like he is running hot. He is playing his ass off. And because he is just so freakish in terms of the things that he's able to do on a court when he catches one of these ridiculous lobs or when he has the block that he did where he put that thing damn near through the backboard, everybody gets fired up on it. Everyone gets excited about it. And uh, it's 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 really, really um, important, I think, for UConn in the way that they kind of play. So uh, I was super, super impressed by that. Every time that he came in, it was like a momentum changing moment. Like he, he stepped on the floor and um, and like they would stretch the lead when he was out there. Right. He would come in and it would kind of stem the tide of a run that was going on. Like, I, I don't think that and that's not to say that there was anything wrong with what say with what Donovan Klingon did. It just this. I don't think this was the matchup for him. I don't think this was the game for him. Um, the problem with having a guy like him where you need someone to kind of go out and get a bucket in the post, like you throw it into him and he tries to back a dude down. And uh, he is just, he doesn't have the low center of gravity. Like he, his, his skill set is not giving him the ball 12 feet away from the basket and say, all right, go get a layup out of this. Like Adama Sinogos was like Zach Eadies is. That's just not what his, uh, that's not what makes him as good as he is and what makes him a lottery pick. So um yeah, I was I was very very pleased to see what Samson did, and I think the most important part is if you watched on the bench, like Donovan was out there having as much fun as anybody else celebrating his teammates. On it wasn't like he was pouting on the bench, and I think that says something about the culture. It says something about the team. It says something about Donovan, uh, and it says something about what UConn basketball is. So all good things there uh, in my mind. Um, solo ball over the weekend showed a couple flashes. Like he had a couple offensive rebounds, put back dunks that were big. He knocked down a couple threes and it looks like he's starting to get it going a little bit. Um, I don't think that he is the perfect fit yet for what UConn needs out of a guard, but he does a really good job. I, I think again, look, they need Steph Castle back to be able to hit their ceiling and solo ball being the guy that comes in as the sixth man to replace any of the three guards is, it's just so perfect because, you know, Steph Castle, Tristan Newton, and Cam Spencer can all create off the bounce. They can all play that lead guard role. They can all play that point guard role. Hassan Diar, who we'll get to in a second, can do all that stuff too. So at this point to me, like Solo is great as an energy eye off the bench. It's the offensive spark that UConn really needs. A guy that can, again, put up a lot of points really uh, in a hurry. But um, it's not an ideal world, ideal world when he's starting but they were able to survive it. Diara to me was enormous steadying presence. Um, it, it It's weird to kind of say it like this, but he's calm while being a defensive menace as well. You know, he, he makes a lot of those hustle plays. He, he plays with a lot of heart. Like he had some really nice passes and for some really important assists. And at the same time, he can do all of that without, really getting out of control too often. And, and and one of the things you kind of see is guys that play like that sometimes might take it to a level that's a little bit too much, whereas that's not – like he hasn't done that so far this year. Maybe a little bit we, – we saw some of those moments last year, but we haven't really seen that this year. And and I think it's big if he can kind of continue to be that guy. Uh, Jaden Stewart, Jalen Ross, like – no, Jalen Stewart, Jaden Ross. I'm gonna get that confused every 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 single time we do one of these. But um, they were just okay. Like they're they're not quite ready for this level. Uh, freshmen aren't supposed to be ready for what we saw on uh, on Monday night. That was a high high level, intense physical basketball game between two really good teams. And um, you know, I I just I think that they are guys that you need to look at and hopefully they look at it like this as two to three year players and um if they continue to develop like the the one thing that just stood out to me so much about this weekend is like <laughs> these Yukon guys just keep getting better like it doesn't matter what the names are or who the players are wearing that laundry when they step on the floor if they got a Yukon jersey on they're going to play a certain kind of way they're going to do a certain kind of thing they're going to do their job they're going to play their ass off and 
Uh, it's a lot of fun to watch, and it's a really good time to be a UConn fan. Um, so I, I let's talk a little bit about big picture now because I'm feeling better about where this team is in terms of what their long-term upside is for the season, right? Like they were dominant for 70 of the 80 minutes that they played in Madison Square Garden against uh, a probably like borderline bubble team in Indiana and a um, – a limited and injured, but still very, very good Texas team um, without Klingon really playing anywhere near his best basketball with Stephen Castle out and with uh, Tristan Newton and Alex Caravan each trading off, uh, having an off night. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, I I, I will say that the, the defensive concerns and the things that worry me on that end um, kind of came to light, especially in the last 10 minutes against Texas. Uh Dylan Mitchell and Malik Renew was both able to kind of go right at Alex Caravan, and he's never going to be an elite defender. I still think he needs to get a little bit better than what he was this weekend. I think that if you asked Alex, he would probably tell you that as well. Um, I think Hunter being able, Tyrese Hunter being able to get downhill and create late. He finished with 13.7 assists, zero turnovers, made a couple big plays um, in the half court. That's kind of where, my biggest concern is there with the guards, right? Like you don't really have that guy that you can put on a downhill creator that can shut off the water there, especially when you're playing like with a drop coverage and you're letting these guys get over the screens. And um, I think Castle solves a lot of that when he comes back and when he gets healthy, uh, mostly because he is probably the one dude on the roster that can really help you keep someone like Tyrese Hunter out of the lane while also being able to deal with someone like a Dylan Mitchell if he's given Alex Harriban problems. He, he's just such a perfect, versatile defensive weapon that um, I think that he 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 solves a lot of the issues that we saw with UConn. Um, overall, I think that uh, Klingon's presence in the middle is just – sometimes you forget just what having the Great Wall of Bristol in the paint uh, can do for a defense, right? And – you kind of got to see it in person to remember just how much that massive seven foot three enormous cling Kong does when, uh, when teams try to drive, like it's just, it, it, he's, he's enormous, man. It's like, uh, it, it's like a normal sized person having three brooms that they can hold up in the air when you're trying to play defense. It's just, it, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, Overall, I think the perimeter defense was pretty good. I, I'm still worried about the one-on-one stuff and the guys being able to break you down. But once you get Stephen Castle back, I think that Spencer and Newton are good enough where um, they can do a, a good enough job to keep somebody in front if it's not the best player on the other team. So, uh, yeah, I'm 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 in. I'm I'm in on the upside of the group, and I feel better about this team on that end of the floor after watching them against Texas than I did before the game against Texas. Um, and I think the other big thing is it, it's not that it, this shouldn't be taken lightly. Like Texas had a big late run in that game. Um, UConn got tested. They got pushed. They were up by 16 and they kind of melted that lead away all the way down to four. Right. And uh, there was game pressure involved. There was a loud crowd involved. There was uh, the kind of like, lemon booty uh nerve wracking um feeling that you get when you are the better team and you're kind of giving a game away in front of an arena that has the majority of your fans uh i think it's similar to what we saw last year at seton hall when uconn was up by 17 in the second half and kind of gave that thing away and it didn't happen here they didn't fold now I don't think that it's necessarily the greatest thing in the world that the reason it didn't happen was because Alex Caravan hit three ridiculously tough uh, mid-range shots, which are just kind of antithetical to the analytic style offense and and analytically minded game plan and offensive identity that UConn has. But sometimes you just got to toss the game plan in the trash and let your players go make a play and let your guys go win a game. And that's what Alex Caravan did. And you like those shots went in. It wasn't like they were fluky. It wasn't like he banked in bad shots. It wasn't like it hit the front of the rim and hit the back of the rim. They hit the top of the backboard and they rolled around three times and went in. Like they were good. They were buckets. They were tough, but they were buckets. And uh, it's nice to see him be able to do that. Um, It's not something that I think UConn is going to want to rely on. Like those are difficult, difficult shots, but 
it's good to see that he's able to make him if he needs to make him. Now, turn your attention forward um, at this point, right? Like Manhattan, New Hampshire, uh, those should be wins. Then it's at Kansas, and then North Carolina and the Jimmy V Classic. Now, what's interesting is Stephen Castle told Myron Medcalf before the Texas game that he will be pushing to get back uh, for Kansas for that trip to Fog Allen Field House. He had the procedure done Thursday of last week. Uh, two weeks in a day from that procedure is when um, UConn heads to play at Kansas. And this was a two to four week injury. Uh, I'm not going to put a timestamp on this because I don't think that's fair to do. Uh, but I will say that like talking with people um, in and around the program on Sunday, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was like how non concerned people were about, Steph Castle, the knee, the long-term issues with all of that. Um, the the one of the quotes I got from some of the, uh, the source uh, around the program was, "quote He's already ahead of schedule." So we'll see what that means. We'll see if that means he gets back in time. I would still advocate for taking every single necessary precaution possible to make sure that this doesn't mess with him for long term of the season. Uh, to make sure that you're not doing anything to the knee um, that would uh, would hinder his ability to go out and make like eight or nine figures worth of dollars uh, at the NBA when he eventually gets there. But you know what? If the doctors say he's good and he wants to play like, all right, let's roll him out there. Let's make it happen. Let's go out and win in the fog. So uh, in terms of what the ceiling is for this group, (laughs) man, like they are legitimately awesome again Um, for my money. After seeing uh, six of the top, teams in person in the last couple of weeks. I think there are nine teams at the top of college basketball that are kind of in the same realm and in the same conversation when it comes to winning a national championship, Kansas, Purdue, Houston, and Arizona to me would be uh, the top four right now, which are a slight cut above Marquette, Creighton, Tennessee, UConn, and Duke. Yes, Duke. I know. Fuck off. Whatever. They're still really, really talented. Uh, but the biggest takeaway that I've had, is the gap between a team like Kansas or a team like Purdue is not as much as I thought it would be between a team like like a UConn or a Tennessee, right? As much as what I thought it was coming into the season. And um, I'm also very impressed by the fact that I think UConn will be able to match up with teams that want to go small ball much better with the, the performances we're seeing out of Samson, right? Like, for example, Marquette is not going to allow Donovan Klingon to just kind of camp out in the lane and do what he wants to do with the five spot. They're going to be able to take advantage of that with the offense they run and also with Godara pulling away from the basket. Villanova does similar stuff. Duke, Miami, Kentucky, like there's a whole bunch of teams that do similar stuff by trying to pull big guys away from the basket. Having Samson Johnson is something of an equalizer because that's not a bad matchup for UConn anymore. So, Look, I'm here for the ride. I love the ride as much as I do winning it. Um, I enjoy the process more than the ultimate result. It's something that I've come to learn about myself and and, and the way that these these seasons kind of go. But this team is, without a doubt, uh, they have the pieces to be able to make a run at repeating. Um, Before we do that, let's worry about going out and winning a Big East regular season title and winning a Big East tournament title and then, uh, trying to find a way to win six games in March, but uh, man, they're good enough, man. They're good enough. I did not, they're better than I thought they were coming into the season. And that is, uh, that is something to be said because I thought that this was a top 10 team in college basketball coming into the season. So uh, with that said, hell of a weekend, um, a great way to start off beast week. Can't wait to watch the rest of the Maui invitational, which is unbelievably loaded and unbelievably fun. The Bahamas, uh, the battle for Atlantis is going to be a lot of fun to watch. So I'm going to go stuff my face with Turkey here in a couple of days. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid putting on 25 pounds um, during the process. Uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, I drink as much booze as I possibly can over the course of that process as well. Got to celebrate when you can, right? Yukon Huskies. Empire Classic. 